The word of God from Daniel chapter 1, Daniel's captivity in Babylon. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. The king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them, from the Judahites, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear the Lord my king who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner and the other young men your age than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. As Pastor Jeff said, my name is Isaiah. I'm one of the other pastors here at Sojourn. I'm going to encourage you to take a copy of the scriptures and turn to what was just read for us, Daniel 1. As we continue our series in this particular book. Let me add my welcome to you if this is one of your first time uh, at Sojourn Community Church. The word sojourn describes a temporary stay. It reminds us that we are on a journey and we're not home yet. Now you may feel settled in. Maybe you even have purchased a home recently and feel like you're getting settled. Maybe your life is just beginning to click along and feel like you're starting to get a grasp on things. But there are reminders all around us that we aren't really home yet, right? Maybe for you it's a friend's deconstruction or loneliness, untimely death or miscarriage illness, shootings in our city, drug epidemics, plenty of reminders that we're not home yet. We are living, with a nod to John Steinbeck, east of Eden. Paul reminds Christians that we are citizens of heaven. Peter writes one of his epistles and describes those temporarily residing abroad, chosen as exiles. So the question before us is, how do we survive and thrive as sojourners while we wait for home? We aren't the first people to wrestle with this question. Similar to Adam and Eve's exile from Eden and being sent east, The Old Testament Israelites were exiled from their homeland and sent east to Babylon. So as a church named Sojourn, we locate our heritage in a people who have had to figure out how to thrive and survive away from home in a world unfriendly to God. The book of Daniel was written for people like us. So let's listen as God tells us what we need to know in order to thrive as sojourners. Now Daniel chapter 1 is divided into three scenes. So let's just break it down that way, okay? Scene 1, God reigns in geopolitics. God reigns in geopolitics. The text places us squarely in the year 605 BC. King Jehoiakim is the anointed king of Israel. He's a direct descendant of King David. 
He's on the throne, and Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army sweeps west and south down into Israel. And without any fanfare, without any description, Daniel simply records that King Nebuchadnezzar besieges Jerusalem. You can read more about that in 2 Kings 23 and 24. Now, as you read narrative, look carefully at the specific words that the author has chosen. Today, describing this event, a historian might say, Babylonia, or Babylon's army defeated Israel's army. If you were living back in 605 BC, you would have said without reservation, the God of the Babylonians, Marduk, defeated the God of Israel, Yahweh. But God's perspective is different. How does God describe the events? God says that the sovereign Lord gives his anointed king into the hands of the Babylonian king. Not just his anointed king, but he gives the temple items set aside for the worship of Yahweh. He sends those home with King Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Well, God is fulfilling his promise. He covenanted to bless the Israelites if they were faithful to him and to scatter them if they were not. And prophet after prophet after prophet told the Israelites of their unfaithfulness and they refused to repent and turn back to God. But even when they seemed to be in the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar, in reality, God's people are still in God's hands. And friends, the same is true today. When kings and rulers conquer, when kingdoms and nations rise and fall, when political parties rise and fall, God is in control. Because God reigns in geopolitics. That's scene one. Scene two, God reigns in individual experience. Well, Nebuchadnezzar immediately begins to solidify his power. He's just conquered Judah, so what does he do? First, he takes the temple items used for worship back to Babylon with him. Now, the CSB describes Babylon as Babylon. But if you have a little note there and look down, the word is actually Shinar. And maybe your translation in front of you says he took those items to the land of Shinar. Now, for a Jewish person, reading that the temple items ended up in Shinar would be like hearing in 1940 that the Declaration of Independence had been put on display at the Reichstag in Hitler's Berlin. Unthinkable. Humiliating. Shinar in the Bible always describes a place of rebellion against God. It was the plain of Shinar in which the, the uh, Tower of Babel, I almost said the Temple of Babel, the Tower of Babel was built. Shinar was a place in opposition to God and God's kingdom, where, where wickedness was at home. It was full of self-will, self-aggrandizing, and false religion, as some authors describe it. And that sounds a little bit like the world that we live in, doesn't it? So in the Bible, Shinar stands in stark contrast to the kingdom of God, representing any kingdom set up against God. In an Old Testament Shinar or Babylon or in the world of today, God worshipers are going to face extreme, even epic challenges. That's just the nature of the world in which we live. But there's a second way Nebuchadnezzar begins to solidify his power, and he does that through a forced study abroad program. Certain exiles are brought together to be assimilated and educated in Shinar, in Babylon. Ashpenaz is the director of Babylon University's study abroad program, and the prereqs for this particular program are intense. Verse 3 tells us you had to be from the nobility. Verse 4 describes you had to be a, a young man of a certain age. The word for young man there can describe anyone from an infant to a young adult. But based on the education practices of the ancient Near East, these young men were most likely 
13 to 15 years old. You had to be physically healthy without any physical defect. Verse 4. You had to be handsome. No faces only a mother could love allowed to go to Babylon in this first removal. And you had to be suitable for instruction in all wisdom, the text says, knowledgeable and perceptive. Now, how ironic. Babylon wanted in these young men what could only come with fearing, worshiping, and respecting the one true God. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs tells us. And notice further in verse 5 that the king intended them to receive the best food and the best instruction for three years, the best education. Among those chosen, we're told of four, simply four. We don't know how many hundreds, just four do we know. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Their names, their Hebrew names, include references to God. You can see El in two of those names. That's the Hebrew word for God. The other two names include a reference for Yah or Yahweh, the actual name of God. But in Shinar, in Babylon, their names are changed. And their names are changed to include the names of specific false gods of the Babylonians. So friends, you ought to be able to, in the air condition this morning, feel the heat of intense cultural pressure rising from the pages of your Bible in front of you. And in reality, aren't you also familiar with that sense of cultural pressure? Living with nearly constant reminders that we're in a strange land with foreign customs as individuals whose loyalty belongs somewhere else living among a people who ignore or merely tolerate or at worst despise the God that we worship. Are these young men going to make it? Are they going to survive? Is there even any hope that they could possibly thrive in such a context? Well, the youthful exiles have no choice on the location of their new home. They have no choice on the details of their name change. Those are put on them, the text literally says. But not all decision making is entirely out of their hands. Notice that while God reigns over geopolitics and over our individual experiences, we are still active agents in God's plan. Look at verse 8. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. Now, before we go any further, we have to ask the question, What's so bad about the food and the wine? What is the big deal? Well, to answer that question, let's listen to Joyce Baldwin. Joyce Baldwin is the former dean of women at Trinity College, and this is what she writes. By Eastern standards, to share a meal was to commit oneself to friendship. It was of covenant significance. Those who had thus committed themselves to allegiance accepted an obligation of loyalty to the king. It would seem that Daniel rejected this symbol of dependence on the king because he wished to be freed to fulfill his primary obligations to the God he served. Now, the defilement he feared was not so much a ritual defilement as a moral defilement arising from the subtle flattery of gifts and favors which would entail hidden implications of loyal support, however dubious the king's future policies might prove to be. That's what's wrapped up in the food and drink offered to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, friends, in our context, a meal rarely carries this degree of weight. But there are other ways that our culture exerts similar pressure on us to demonstrate loyalty. Pressure on us to celebrate what the culture celebrates. Pressure on us to virtue signal that we are on the same team 
as everybody else. And it cuts both ways, progressive and conservative. We see it in Pride Month, as companies expect their employees to celebrate with unreserved loyalty a particular cause, and the alternatives are not attractive. But we see this loyalty test when politicians and presidents put themselves on pedestals and expect blind obedience. And young person, you may experience the first loyalty test of your life when your new job schedules you during your church's Sunday morning gathering, when you told them you wouldn't and you couldn't. So Christian, in this world, expect your culture to give you loyalty tests that reveal where our true allegiance lies. We will, at times, be forced to choose between failing the culture's loyalty test because we're loyal to our God or compromising our convictions and conforming. And if you are not yet a follower of Jesus, let me ask you this. Are you tired of the pressure to always be on the right side of history? The pressure to always follow the party line or the cultural pressure on a given issue at the risk of being sidelined or silenced or overlooked? Aren't you tired of trying to walk those landmines? Friends, there's a better way to live. There's a better king to live for. There's a better kingdom to live in. It may require cultural diminishment, but the freedom you gain is infinitely better. Well, back to Daniel. Here's where it gets fun, y'all. The tension is building, and we need to read the text in this way. Now, let's draw out some parallels so we can begin to feel this tension. Daniel has a couple of extreme options on the table in front of him from which to choose as one of God's worshipers trying to be faithful to God in a hostile world. And we have these same choices today, these extreme choices. We can, one, always dance to the tune the culture plays, or two, always denounce whatever the culture does. We can overappreciate culture, or we can underappreciate culture. We can accommodate completely, or avoid the world entirely, or at least try to. And the reality is, at various points, Christians have tried both extremes. And you're probably thinking through your journey and aligning yourself somewhere, you denounce, you underappreciate, and you avoid ent entirely. That's what good, faithful Christians do, according to fundamentalism. But that's unhealthy. But so is the alternate extreme. That is equally unhealthy. Friends, when we follow Jesus, we are part of a different king with a different kingdom. We don't have to be afraid of what culture offers. After all, our king is calling people from every nation, language, people, and tongue on the face of the planet to worship him in his kingdom. So we don't have to be afraid of what culture offers. We should celebrate the good within culture. And we should expect also that we can't embrace everything that a given culture throws at us. At some point, we're going to have to draw a line. We're going to have to make a choice. For example, in entertainment. Drawing a line may look like rejecting the algorithms that Twitter or YouTube or Amazon or Netflix throw at us. Friends, just because sex sells products and movies doesn't mean that we should buy into that as artistic. There's a line we need to draw. Another example, how about drawing a line in politics? Now, you may sway towards one political platform over the other, but do so as a thinking Christian, not as a blind follower. Be willing to critique planks within that party platform. Don't embrace it as God's will for every Christian. It's not. As, king, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven... As followers of Jesus, we can reject party tribalism. We must reject party tribalism. 
You have been freed, Christian, to live in this world as a citizen of heaven. So you should never perfectly fit in any of the world's boxes. None of them. There's always going to be some way you don't align. Daniel receives the name change. He's even willing to study, to study the occultic literature of Babylon. And learning the language, no problem. But he draws a line somewhere. And friends, that's the point. If we're never drawing a line somewhere, then where does our allegiance actually lie? At some point in a world hostile to God, each of us has to draw a line. It's not going to be easy. I see here in Daniel's line drawing five features that will help us as we seek to draw our own lines out of allegiance to God. First, there's conviction, then there's courage, creativity conversation and community and yes i had to alliterate them i just can't help it first conviction because he's loyal to god he remains principled convictional how's it going to get worked out that's an irrelevant question it doesn't matter how it's going to get worked out he's convinced it's time to draw the line he then works out that conviction with courage he just outright asked the guy in charge to help him not to defile himself morally. Talk about courage. Can you put yourself in his shoes going to talk to your boss about what your company expects you to celebrate? Courage. How will it work out? How will his request be received? That's also irrelevant. He's taking a step of faith-fueled courage. But then there's creativity involved. You see, the guy in charge doesn't actually say no. Do you see that? He doesn't say no to Daniel's request. He seems to word it in such a way that if Daniel can find a loophole, if Daniel can figure out how not to endanger this guy's life, then Daniel's free to explore an option. And guess what? Daniel's got a creative idea. So Daniel goes to the guy directly over he and his friend. Not the guy that oversees the study abroad program, but, you know, the, the resident monitor maybe. He goes to this guy and he has a conversation. He devises a test to give them different food over a short 10-day period of time. And guess what? This guy agrees. Sure, we'll give it a shot. Not just courage and creativity on display, but conversation. Friends, in order for us to not defile ourselves in this world, to survive and thrive with our loyalty to God intact and our integrity maintained, it will involve, involve risky and difficult decisions and conversation. And notice Daniel sees these Individuals he speaks to as citizens, yes, of the anti-God or anti-kingdom of God, but they are individuals to engage with. He doesn't reject them, he rejects their worldview. He doesn't isolate from them, he engages with them create creatively and through conversation. But notice finally that it's not just Daniel acting like a lone ranger. He's acting in community, on behalf of and with friends. The young men strengthen one another in their convictions. And friends, staying faithful to God in Shinar, in Babylon, requires community. And that is why we will unashamedly as a church, repeatedly to the point of sounding like a broken record, push community. It's not that we want church community to be one option among many equal options for you to choose from in order to become the person you want to be. That's not it at all. We believe without apology 
that our individual flourishing and our spiritual safety requires the involvement of other believers in our lives. Walking with us. Speaking truth to us. Helping us think creatively about what it looks like to live with integrity and allegiance to God in a world that wants nothing but to destroy that. So, time for a shameless plug. If you aren't involved in Christian community outside of the Sunday morning gathering, we want to call you to something, invite you to be involved in community connected to a local church. Connected to a local church. If you have more questions about what that looks like here, we would love to talk to you about our life group. They're starting up here September. Go ahead and snap that QR code up here or on the card in the seat back pocket in front of you. Fill your information out. Check that you'd like to join a life group. and We'll be in touch. We'll give you more information. There are pamphlets out on the counter to the right as you exit this space that describe our life groups. Folks, this isn't about us accruing numbers so we can celebrate at the end of the year that we've got X number of life groups and X number of people involved. It really isn't. We could care less about that. This is about us walking in community in Babylon. Because we need each other. Community. But let's not overlook something here. In verse 2, we saw God giving Nebuchadnezzar a gift. He gave Nebuchadnezzar, King Jehoiakim, and the temple vessels. And here in verse 9, God is giving another gift. He gives to Daniel two words, kindness and compassion, which results in favor with Ashpenaz. Kindness is a word all over the pages of the Old Testament. It's the word hesed, steadfast love, faithful covenantal love it's god's love of decision and the word compassion is the word for mercy if we can word it this way it's what god in a sense feels towards us what does god give his loyal people in a hostile world steadfast love and mercy compassion some of us needed this reminder this week he determines to act towards us in love, and he feels compassion towards us. And with all our convictions and confidence and creativity and conversation and community, all of which is important, it's the steadfast love and compassion of God that supports and keeps us. I wonder if you doubt that. I wonder if you doubt, Christian, that God acts towards you with steadfast love and feels towards you compassion. Further, I wonder if you doubt that it will be his steadfast love and mercy that will keep you. Well, it's what kept Daniel and his three friends. Look at verse 14. The chief eunuch agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now, friends, there's been a lot of misunderstanding about this particular passage. God is not advertising a particular diet plan. Daniel is not offering a diet plan we should follow. Ten days of lesser food than what the king provided should not have made a significant positive difference, but it did. The author intends that we see something supernatural at work here. God is faithful to preserve his people, sometimes by means beyond the human ability, ability to explain. That's sometimes how his steadfast love and compassion get expressed. And that brings us to the third scene. Scene three, God reigns over his children's cultural influence. 
Look at verse 17. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. At the end of the time that the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found to equal Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to attend the king. In every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them in, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in his entire kingdom. So Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. For the third time in this chapter, God is giving gifts. And what does he give? He gives these men exactly what they had committed themselves to already. Exactly more of what they needed to thrive in their context. Exactly what the powers that be wanted. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And he gives to Daniel the capacity to understand and interpret dreams, which, by the way, is going to become pretty crucial for the rest of the book of Daniel. These men didn't just survive exile in Babylon. They thrived. Because of God's steadfast love and compassion, and because God reigns, God enables them to bless the Babylon that besieged their city and broke their kingdom. Without them becoming Babylon in the process. And friends, God does the same thing today. The God of Daniel 1 is the same God we have sung to and worshipped this morning. And the last sentence of this chapter is the best by far. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. What's so big about that? Well, King Cyrus was the king of the empire that would defeat Babylon 60 years later. Sure, the Babylonians would defeat Israel, but these God worshipers are going to outlive Babylon. That's beautiful. So, sojourners, what do we see in Daniel 1? Well, we see that affliction and humiliation precede vindication. Christians, this is our reality that we would sometimes rather forget. The Christian life will ultimately result in being vindicated, not just before earthly powers, but before spiritual powers in the heavenly places as God unveils us as his children to the universe. That's vindication. But before that, there's humiliation. There's affliction. There's suffering. This shouldn't surprise us. After all, even for the Lord Jesus, there's the cross before the crown. There's groaning before glory. We also see here God's sovereignty over the nations, including our own. This knowledge eliminates fear as a motivating factor, especially during election season. We don't have to react in fear, fighting to achieve or maintain a conservative or progressive vision of utopia, because utopia or the good life doesn't exist apart from Jesus, and we've been given that. Instead, motivated by the steadfast love and compassion of God, we move from that place of love into a world desperate for love. So friends, we have a new kingdom and a new king that defines our reality, so we are freed to use our votes strategically and even diversely from person to person as an expression of our love to God and our love for neighbor. Never demanding uniformity among believers, but embracing fellow believers regardless of their political persuasion. And friends, the American church forgot this the last 10 years. 
let's remember it now. Let's embrace this as a church. Let's hold our citizenship as members of the kingdom of heaven in higher regard than we do whatever we mark on our ballots. Because our allegiance is to King Jesus, first and foremost. And then from the voting box, we leave that place and enter our world and use whatever skills and gifts that God has given to us to influence the small spheres of culture he's entrusted us with. We go and we bless Babylon. So dads and moms, prepare your children to bless Babylon. Model this by loving your neighbors. Those of you in the healthcare profession, exercise all your skill to heal disease and treat illness, being mindful of the whole person. Counselors and therapists, bless your clients, convinced that human flourishing ultimately finds expression in joyfully and worshipfully receiving our created identities from the God who gives us life. And you may not have the freedom to verbally express that in so many words in so many settings, but don't allow the culture to emasculate your convictions as a worshiper of God. Don't allow your culture to shame you into cultural conformity. Teachers, office workers, managers, whatever you do, as you follow God in the world, be quick to bless Babylon and ready to draw lines out of loyalty to God, convictionally, courageously, creatively engaging in conversation and walking in community. And guess what? We all get to strengthen each other as we do this. Well, the chapter ends with a soft note of hope. Remember Cyrus, last sentence of Daniel 1? Cyrus is described in Isaiah 44 as God's shepherd, as the Lord's anointed. That word is actually the same word we get the word Messiah from. Now, why would the Bible describe Cyrus, a pagan king, in these ways? Well, because God used him to bring his children from exiles back to the promised land. Daniel 1 begins with some of the darkest days in Israel's history, and it ends with the hope that the exile will one day end because of a king named Cyrus. And friends, that should point us beyond Daniel. That should point us beyond the exile, beyond Cyrus, to the greater, perfect, anointed Messiah King. Who will come, who will deliver all of those who follow him, who will bring us back to paradise. He is the true and the greater king who is behind all world geopolitics, behind individual human experience, and behind his people's cultural influence. His name is King Jesus, and he has modeled for us humiliation and affliction leading to vindication. He's modeled blessing Babylon and living faithfully in a dangerous world. So friends, as we look to Daniel for courage to thrive and survive in a hostile world, let's see Jesus. He's coming again. We sang that this morning. He will bring me home. So until that day, let's stay faithful until he comes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us the encouragement of a book like Daniel. Thank you for not just the example of a man, a young man, four young men who remained faithful to you despite incredible cultural pressure. Thank you for this and even more than this. Thank you that it points us to King Jesus. Father, we thank you for saving us. 
We thank you for calling us into your kingdom. We've already confessed this morning the ways in which we have not lived as citizens of your kingdom ought to live. So, Father, give us grace, courage, creativity, compassion. Help us to live in community with one another. Help us to be creative as we think about what it looks like to be faithful men and women of integrity. And God, give us the grace to bless Babylon while we are here. And we pray this in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.